Morning, everyone. Thanks for braving our multi-day snow event to come out to today's talk. My name is Jim Gardner. I'm one of the researchers here at the museum, and this, of course, is our Royal Tyrrell Museum speaker series sponsored by our Cooperating Society. So, big shout out to them for continuing to support this and everything else they do for us. So today we're uh, welcoming back Dr. Femka Hawerda. She was the Betsy Nichols postdoc fellow here from March of 2000 till August of 2023. And today Femka is going to talk a bit about some of the work that she did during her postdoc here. A little bit of background, Femke is from the Netherlands. She did her master's in um, biogeology at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and then a PhD at Ludwig Maximilian University and the Natural History Museum in Munich, working on Middle Jurassic sauropods. Uh, she's done postdoctoral work in Germany, doing some biochemical analyses of Cretaceous dinosaurs, and then at the Tyrol Museum here for three years. Uh, her ongoing research projects involve reconstructing ecosystems of the Cretaceous and investigating the early evolution of sauropod dinosaurs in the Jurassic. And she's currently residing back in the Netherlands with her husband, who will be next week's speaker, uh, toddler and guinea pigs, and is working on promoting open access publishing through Ultrac University. So Femke, take it away. Thanks, Jim, for making me sound really, really cool. <laughs> and uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here. Yeah, so um, I'll be talking a little bit about my uh, Mosasaur feeding ecology research that I did here, interspersed with, um, because everything is connected, as you all know, uh, with some uh, uh, Dutch Mosasaur research as well. So yeah, we're back in the Netherlands now. We used to live here in Drumheller, um, so it's great to be back. Um, yeah, and as you know, in the Netherlands, everything happens by bike, even moving furniture around. A um, bit different from here. So yeah, I was here for three years um, doing all sorts of things under the Betsy Nichols Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, um, studying the wonderful Mosasaurus of the Tyrell Collection. Um, I did research here, I went to the laboratory, and I did outreach, and I did field work, and uh, yeah, it was a really cool three and a half years. I, I assume that everybody knows what a mosasaur is, but just in case, um, they are extinct marine reptiles from the late Cretaceous period, so around um, 80 to 66 million years ago. And I always like to compare them to just big monitor lizards that swim in the sea and then they have flippers instead of uh, handsome feet. They were completely marine and they were um, everywhere. They were a hugely successful bunch of uh, marine reptiles. And you find them all over the world in all shapes and sizes as well. And uh, especially here at the Terrell. So today I will walk you through a whole lot of topics, but I will uh, keep it broad. So um, if you do have specific questions, there should be ample time afterwards. I will be talking about um, microware, which I'll um, elaborate on in a little bit, um, both 2D and 3D microware on mosasaur teeth, and then the whole biogeochemical shebang. And I will also walk you through that, do not worry. But first, why teeth? Because you have all these wonderful mosasaur fossils, and then I focus on the tiniest element of these giant fossils that we have here. Well, the idea is that uh, teeth actually are a great record for um, paleontological um, and ecological events throughout the fossil records. They have been around for at least 500 million years, so the fossil record of teeth and therefore of, of life constructed via tooth research goes back 500 million years. And because teeth are pretty durable, you know, just tap on your own teeth, they're pretty hard, um, they preserve really well, and so they uh, preserve sometimes better than bones. And the nice thing about this hardness is also is that they will uh, preserve the chemical signature from when the animal was alive millions and millions of years ago, as opposed to bones who are too brittle and are prone to diagenesis. And well, as I said already, um, because uh, this nice hard layer of enamel kind of encapsulates what um, 
the animal incorporates, it's, it uh, is a great trace method for um, chemical elements that we want to study for um, the animal's life reconstruction, such as carbon and oxygen strontium isotopes. Another neat thing about teeth is that often they preserve more times than bones. This is also because reptiles shed their teeth more often. Like us humans, we only shed our teeth once in our lifetime. The odds weirdo maybe one more time, but that's very rare. Um, most of us just one time, but these reptiles continuously kept replacing their teeth. So the likelihood of their teeth ending up in the fossil records is pretty good. And this is great in, for instances where uh, bones or, or just uh, body fossils are not very common. Usually you will find teeth. Um, this is not just with mosasaurs, this is also with dinosaurs. So that's why teeth are great to study. So um, I'll take you back to the Cretaceous for a second. Um, the world looked sort of similar to now, but just the sea level was just a whole lot higher. This is maybe the world where we'll be going back to, um, well, I don't know, give it a couple of hundred years, I guess. Um, the, there was no ice on the poles. It was a really nice and warm world, a nice warm sea, nice tropical inland shallow seas everywhere with, well, you can imagine high production levels. So teeming with life and fish, so, and other animals. And uh, well, basically everything that swam around was prey to these mosasaurs. Um, we had also turtles, big fish, sharks, and plesiosaurs. And I did this on purpose because, as you know, plesiosaurs do not have heads preserved, like ever. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, I decided to decapitate this plesiosaur for dramatic effect. Um, I'll walk you through quickly the mosasaurs that I've been using for these studies. So I'll start with the Dutch mosasaurs from the Maastrichtian, which is the very end stage of um, the dinosaur era. And this is uh, actually in my home country in the Netherlands, which is uh, kind of cool. The um, problem though is that all these nice skulls are very, very rare. Um, so that's why teeth research comes in handy again. Uh, there's not that many bones, but there are teeth preserved to study. So if you want to know something about those mosasaurs from the type Maastrichtian, you study their teeth. Um, also, a nice fun fact about this fossil is that it was one of the first mosasaurs ever to be discovered. And it was kind of at the base of, or the cradle of, paleontology as we know it today, because people found these fossils and they had no idea what to do with it. It's like, is it a whale? Is it a crocodile? No, it's nothing that we know. But then how can that be? Because everybody that, that lives and dies is, is around now. And this idea of a world before our world was very radical. Um, but people started to, to realize that, that there are fossils of extinct animals in the ground. So that's kind of cool that a mosasaur is kind of at the cradle of paleontology, if you will. Unfortunately, it's not in the Netherlands at the moment. It's, um, you can admire it in Paris because it was looted during the French occupation. But there are other fossils uh, to be admired in the Netherlands. So we have about five Mosasaur species confirmed in the Netherlands now. Mosasaurus is the most famous one. It also made a really nice appearance in Jurassic World. Uh, it being way, 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 way too big. Um, but um, I think they were a decent 12 meters long, which is already big enough. And that's definitely not something you want to go swim with. Um, other big mosasaur that we have is Prognathodon saturator. And a slightly smaller type of Prognathodon, Prognathodon sartorius. And then there are two small, well, I'm saying small for mosasaur standards, mosasaurus plyoplatycarpus, uh, let's say about eight meters long. And then Carinodens was a really small mosasaur. For mosasaur standards, three meters long, that would still be big for us, I guess. And then we get to Canada, where we are now here. Um, here in Alberta, there was a big interior seaway, the Western Interior Seaway, and we are here-ish. Um, and from Alberta, we have um, also mosasaurus, but a slightly different type of mosasaurus because we are ever so slightly um, older here in the Bear Paw, we're like 80 or 75 million years old uh, as opposed to 66 million years. 
But still, there's a Mosasaurus type, there's a Prognathodon type, uh, there's Tylosaurus, also a uh, relatively big Mosasaurus, so these three are relatively big. And then also we have uh, the smaller Pliopletocarpus, and then maybe there's the Mosasaurus Conodon. Uh, I'm thinking during my stay here I will hear more updates about this one, because this one is only known from a different set of teeth. Again, the teeth come in handy. Um, so I'm mentioning it, but um, it's not 100% confirmed yet, and I'm pretty sure that Mark will fill me in on that later. <laughs> um, the nice thing about the Mosasaurus here is that the preservation is really, really good. Not just the teeth, but also the fossils. Um, there's, well, as we all know here, there's material with uh, stomach contents, for instance. There's a prognathodon with a turtle in its stomach. There's a Pliopletocarpus with a fish in its stomach. But um, still, this kind of preservation is relatively rare. So if you want to know more about what they ate, you still have to study their teeth. But the great preservation makes that possible because uh, the material is quite pristine. So that helps me reconstruct their feeding ecology. So a quick plug for how awesome field work is, of course. Um, the most most sort of fossils here in Alberta come from uh, mines around Lethbridge, where um, people are mining for amylites. And then when they find the mosasaur, they call the Terrell, and it gets dug up. And uh, if you're lucky, the weather is really nice and, and blue sky and sunny, and you just get to dig uh, plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and turtles. So I was lucky enough to be on field work a couple of times here, which is really cool. Okay, so I talked about microware. I thought I'll just quickly introduce once again what that is. Microware are microscopic dental abrasions. Everybody has them, even us. And um, it happens when uh, teeth grind on teeth or when teeth grind on food, or in these Mosasaurus case, prey. I guess we don't really talk about prey in our human existence, except you know, for the odd few, but um, everybody has microware. So it's kind of like you are what you eat. You can find back the traces of what you are eating in your teeth. The idea is though that you cannot directly trace, okay, you, you had cola and you had fries, but um, the idea is that the amount of hardness of the food items determine the type of microware. So um, I'll show you in a bit how we, under, how we divided this for the Mosasaurus. Uh, but these um, uh, micro abrasions are actually um, indicative of the last weeks to months of the animal's lifetime. So it is a snapshot of what it ate before, um, either before it died or before it shed the teeth. But it's still long enough to be indicative of a, a good amount of its diet. So what me and uh, Dutch colleague Anne Schulp did, which was the first ever uh, microware test on a Mosasaur, is, um, well, we went to the really, 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 really simple way of determining the microware. Um, I will live and die on this hill. I love this method. It is, it is very simple. And because it is very simple, it is also really good for open science. It is uh, an easy method and everybody can basically use it at home. All you need to do is you need to have a fossil tooth or a, a good cast of fossil tooth with good quality uh, resin and a microscope. And that is basically it. You can uh, look under your microscope and you will see these abrasions. So what we did was uh, we divided them into pits, which are these sort of craters that you see. Core scratches like those big grooves that you see and fine scratches, which are the, the, the softer scratches. The idea being that the hardness of the food um, causes, uh, well, if you have harder food, that causes more pits and coarse scratches, and softer food items will cause more finer scratches. And then if you think about these mosasaurs and what is around in the uh, sea, you can imagine that something like a turtle would cause, you know, those pits, Something like a, a big fat lobster or a really hard ammonite would cause those pitch and scratches. And things like a nice juicy squid or a soft fishy will cause fine scratches. Um, and coarse scratches also probably being uh, caused by harder food items. So um, we did this for 
both the um, Strictian mosasaurus and then I went on and did this for the bear paw mosasaurus. Um, I like this one because it's based on the Masari triangle of um, tooth type and feeding guild. So um, here uh, at the lower left corner, this is for the Maastrichtian mosasaurus. You have the little small carinodens with its little bulbous teeth in the likely crush guild because it has those bulbous teeth and that was the idea was that they were uh, supposed to be for crushing little oysters and, and lobsters. Uh, the cutting guild with the more piercing teeth, sorry, the pierced guild with the more piercing teeth for um, more piscivorous mosasaurs such as Blyplatocarpus, which has these little elegant sharp teeth that are kind of reminiscent of plesiosaur teeth as well, uh, very kind of indicative of, of piscivory from their morphology. And everything in between, Prognathodon, a little sturdier tooth kind of between the crushing guilds and the cut guilds where a mosasaurus is with its kind of teeth that are usable for everything. So um, the nice thing was that we uh, at first glance found exactly what we were looking for before we started to look deeper. Uh, meaning for Carinodens we did find a lot of pits and coarse scratches which matched with its tooth morphology and the hypothesis that it was eating lobsters, it was crushing oysters and um, harder food items. For um, Plyoplatocarpus, at first glance, we thought, okay, perfect, it has a lot of fine scratches. So, yeah, it is a, a, a bisquiferous mosasaur. Until we looked a little harder and saw, hey, it's got a lot of coarse scratches. That's not what it's supposed to have, because according to its tooth morphology, it's supposed to eat soft food. So maybe these Plyoplatocarpids were eating something harder. So this was an interesting little tidbit of information and also not according to what they were supposed to do. Um, another funny thing was at first glance the prognathodons with more sturdy teeth um, had a lot of you know bits and coarse scratches, fine. But then actually um, the prognathodon sectorius had more of a, well a little bit of everything but also a lot of finer scratches. And Prognathodon saturator, also some fine scratches. So, okay, just put a pin in that for now um, because we will come back to that later. And then Mosasaurus, we were very happy because Mosasaurus had a nice sort of generalist um, microware in 2D. So, meaning it ate just about anything and that kind of fits with it being the biggest Mosasaur on the block. Um, it being able to eat everything and everybody, uh, but also according to its tooth morphology. Okay, so that was, you know, part one. So then I uh, decided to uh, do this for the, uh, the bear paw mosasaurus because it was COVID lockdown, but we still have an SEM uh, microscope in the building. So I, I could do this really nice and easy um, 2D microware. And again, our Plyoplatocarpus type, again, has a lot of coarse uh, scratches and pits. So uh, this is maybe a trend that Plyoplatocarpins have, despite having those nice little um, small, narrow, piscivorous teeth. Um, our prognathodon is kind of, yeah, similar-ish to the Dutch prognathodon, except also a lot of coarse scratches. I was happier with this than with the Dutch uh, prognathodons because we actually have a prognathodon with a turtle in its stomach. So obviously they were eating still some harder prey. But we will come back to this. And Mosasaurus, uh, also a bit of a generalist here, um, even though it's, it's a slightly smaller type of Mosasaurus than the really big Mosasaurus Hoffmanni from the type Maastrichtian. I was kind of happy with this. So then we went on to uh, another style of microware analysis, which is called Dental Microware Texture Analysis, DMTA, aka 3D microware. So with 2D microware, you only look at the microware basically just as a satellite image from above and uh, you measure what, directly what you see. It's kind of like a, a Martian landscape almost, what you're counting and studying. So with this uh, texture analysis is what you do is um, more a surface scan of the microware. So you look at how deep the pits go and how wide. Um, so it gives more information. The only thing is this is a very um, intensive strategy because you need to have um, this sort of James Bond 007 gun style 
um, epoxy to make molds of the moisture teeth and they need to go into a special um, laser microscope and then you have to um, do a lot of things with the results still. But you do get some interesting results and at first glance, we were really surprised, but when we started to look back at the 2D microware, so this is for the Maastrichtian mosasaurs, um, it kind of all made sense and things started to fall into place. Um, the only sad thing is I do not have the bear paw mosasaurs in this uh, DMTA yet. Um, unfortunately, uh, the person who is helping with uh, that special microscope um, had an injury and is now uh, for health reasons out of the running for a bit. So hopefully that will come in the next year or so. But for the type Maastrichtian Mosasaurus, we've got some uh, surprises. Okay, well, for right off the bat, Mosasaurus is still a generalist. That's fine. Mosasaurus, let me see the blue uh, tooth here. Um, if you kind of divide it under into uh, the feeding gills according to its microware, it kind of falls everywhere right here in the softer vertebrate consumers the carnivores, the piscivores, the harder invertebrate consumers. So let's say the softer invertebrate consumers are uh, animals that eat like really soft prey, like seafood, squid, um, little, you know, little mussels, little, little soft invertebrates. And uh, harder invertebrate consumers will be the guys who will crunch ammonites and really hard oysters. Uh, piscivores, fish eaters, carnivores, meat eaters. So Mosasaurus kind of spreads itself over all of those feeding gills and that is exactly as we expected and exactly as we wanted to see, so that was great. But then looking at the other Mosasaurus, um, this DMTA gives more info than uh, perhaps the 2D did, um, or at least gave a more in-depth picture and just kind of screwed everything up. Um, Plyoplatocarpus, Yes, in the piscivorous guild, fine. But then also one landed in the harder invertebrate consumers. But then thinking back at the 2D, we did see something like this. We did see some um, indications of harder feeding in these plyoplatocarpins. Now, I have no idea what they were doing because, um, yeah, were they eating ammonites maybe? They are quite small mosasaurs with, uh, yeah, quite small narrow teeth. So I have no idea. This is uh, very interesting and something indicative of a plyoplatocarpin lifestyle, apparently. The two prognathodons, which according to their uh, body type and tooth type, were supposed to be, well, also kind of generalist, but also carnivores or harder invertebrate consumers, both end up in the softer invertebrate consumer guild. So this was a bit of a bleep moment. Because um, in retrospect, we did see this from the 2D microware, but because I wasn't looking for it because I was expecting this not to occur in a big fat prognathodon mosasaur, um, wasn't particularly looking for it. But apparently prognathodon is a bit of a lazy, softer invertebrate consumer as a mosasaur. So it was eating soft food. It was eating seafood. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it does make sense. If you're, you know, why be, why make it hard for yourself if you can be lazy and you can just swim up to uh, the shallow feeding grounds in the morning, you know, when the sun comes up and have this seafood buffet ready for you. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a bit of a surprise. And that just comes to show that it's good to combine these 2D and 3D microware analyses to get the best of the results. So I am really curious what is going to come out of the bare palm source in terms of this style of microware. Okay, so moving on to the geochemical part. Um, I will quickly walk you through um, what strontium is and then I will talk about um, the chemical analysis on the Dutch mosasaurs, but that has been mostly done by colleagues of mine. So I will just plug that in for what I did for the bare palm mosasaurs. But I thought strontium is uh, an element that's not so very well known, although it is making a, it, it's becoming a hot topic in paleontology. Um, I think most people know oxygen and carbon isotopes, but strontium is also a very nice tool to use in paleoecological reconstructions. So um, bear with me because it actually uh, is an uptake from the soil 
But the reason why we are using it for the motor source is uh, definitely here in uh, Alberta, we're still close enough to the continental shelf that you actually do get a strontium input from runoff into the sea. So this, the element strontium is um, highly available in soil and then with some sort of trickle-down economy system goes through the food chain. As animals uh, preferentially uptake calcium over strontium, and calcium and strontium being very close in chemical consistency, um, the idea is that with every step down in the food chain, or actually up I should say, strontium becomes a little bit less available. So you'll have the highest strontium amounts in the soil and then a little bit less in plants, a little bit less in plant eaters, and then in the end, the least amount in carnivores. And then if you plug that against calcium, you get a nice spread of, um, yeah, basically positions in the food chain. So this has been done uh, prior uh, also with uh, marine animals and it actually spreads herbivores and carnivores quite nicely. And also in between uh, carnivores, you can see some subtle differences and also between browsers and grazers. Now strontium isotopes, slightly different, but it also comes from soils because soils have different strontium signatures. So if you see different strontium signatures in your sample, that means that the animal will have moved from different feeding grounds. Okay, so the first thing uh, that I did was uh, look at the strontium elements with uh, EDX analysis, which basically shoots uh, beams at the teeth and then uh, the backscatter is uh, measured and then you get your relative amount of elements. And for the bare paw mosasaurus, this gives a really nice figure. I actually should have just stopped here because this is just a really good um, indication of um, niche differentiation in uh, the bare paw mosasaurus and their other components of the ecosystem. I looked at um, Mosasaurus, Tylosaurus, uh, we have one Tylosaurus specimen, I should say, so there's not that much data points from it. But Mosasaurus, Plyoplatycarpus, Prognathodon. Um, there were the odd Elasmosaur teeth, um, they're very rare, but we have a few in our collection, luckily. And then just to have a look at um, other uh, animals from the ecosystem, I looked at uh, sawfish teeth and shark teeth from the bear paw. And it gives a really nice spread, Mosasaurus, the um, generalist from its microware kind of overlaps in terms of strontium, so relative position in the food chain, with just about everybody. And that's what we like to see, right? It was a generalist and its EDX still shows it's a generalist. What I also very much liked was that um, the really piscivorous animals such as the plesiosaurs, they do kind of overlap a little bit with the plyoplatocarpins, indicating still some fish eating behavior in the plyoplatocarpins. Here are the sharks, and uh, especially these bear paw sharks probably also still were like feeding on fish and other things in the sea, um, and not so much on the sea bottom. Sawfish, more on the sea floor, and more girophagus as well, so eating shells, and, and they actually have a little overlap with prognathodon. So, I think this figure really nicely um, complements the, the microware analysis and well, you got your ecosystem basically done. So um, I should have stopped here, but of course I didn't because you always want to know more. So then I went on to uh, study isotopes of the bare palm mosasaurus. So um, once again, I looked at carbon isotopes because carbon isotopes are kind of uh, indicative of diet and position in the food chain. And there's also a fun little uh, extra mosasaur um, fun fact in carbon isotopes, which I will come at later. I looked at oxygen isotopes, and oxygen isotopes, especially in a marine setting, are indicative of salinity, so how salty your seawater is, which is basically also where in the sea you are. Are you near the shore? Are you offshore? And a little bit of temperature. The nice thing about these two isotopes is that they're also very, very easy to measure. You just need a little bit of the tooth and um, you measure them side by side, so you don't need to be as destructive. And then I also measured some strontium isotopes, which as far as I know was the first time anybody ever me measured strontium in Moses for teeth. Um, 
strontium is uh, kind of a, a stable component of seawater. But as I said before, we are close enough to the shelf that I thought we should still get a signal. So first off, um, the carbon isotopes. Actually not too uh, surprising results. The um, platypathocarpins and uh, prognathodons and plesiosaurs all kind of in the same range. Um, you have a slight offset of your sharks and fish, which is what people in other um, carbon isotope studies between mosasaurs and sharks also find, so that's good. Um, one interesting thing is that the tylosaurus is slightly offset. And also, mosasaurus um, is slightly offset in that it has very um, negative values of carbon isotopes. Other than that, I tried to measure a turtle, but uh, I only got a very few data points. I'm not sure if that uh, works. And um, I also don't really know if these lobsters and, and oysters give a proper signal because invertebrates do something very different uh, with their carbon. But so far I was happy. Um, I think this kind of indicates a similar um, area of, of feeding for these animals, but with offsets of those two. So one cool thing that most mosasaurs do, uh, which is already proven, but which I would love to see for other large marine uh, extinct uh, predators, especially, is that they um, fractionate their carbon in a different way if they dive deeper. And this is because of the bore effect. It's what we have as well. If we dive too deep, you get those CO2 bubbles in your um, blood. It's not a very good thing. Um, this is what most mosasaurs apparently suffered from as well, the deeper they dove. And the idea is also that the larger you are, the deeper you dive because the, the bigger your um, feeding grounds are and the smaller you are, you want to stay away from the big mosasaurs uh, that will also try to eat you and you'll stay closer uh, in, in shallower waters, closer to the continental shelf. So this is proven for lots of other mosasaurs around the world by colleagues from the type Maastrichtian, from Denmark, Angola. So, um, and actually the bear paw mosasaurs fit this negative trend as well, where the bigger the mosasaur, the more negative its carbon. So especially our mosasaurs apparently dove quite deep and the rest, um, yeah, the smaller mosasaurs were slightly higher up in the sea level. Ooh. So I think that's nice because that already shows a little bit of habitat fractionation and that they spread between uh, shallower and deeper water. The oxygen isotopes uh, give a similar picture, but we have our prognathodon outlier suddenly. So remember I said uh, oxygen isotopes are indicative of salinity, so how, how deep your seawater is or how much uh, freshwater input you have. And so prognathodon in the bear paw has this huge range. All the other mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and even fish and sharks more or less in the same range. So I thought, okay, that's interesting because that's indicative of, well, they are more or less in the same body of water. Tylosaurus has this really weird offset that I am not 100% sure if that is a, a correct measurement or if that is a, a lifestyle thing. But so you see these two do something different than the other mosasaurs. I think this might be indicative of our prognathodon going to shallower waters to feed on those soft invertebrates, the lazy mosasaur that it is. So, um, but it's also cool that it has that big range because we know that it also ate those turtles that we have in, in our collection. So I think that was one of the mosasaurs that actually just swam back and forth between near shore and offshore. Um, so this is uh, proven for some mosasaurs from um, the Western Interior Sea of Alabama, but those were not prognathodons. So this is really interesting that we see this type of feeding behavior in prognathodons that they actually moved around where the others might have stayed a bit more stationary. Um, one last interesting thing is that uh, the turtles here give also a different signal. Um, so I was wondering if this means that uh, our turtles are also more staying in the uh, near shore settings. Um, or in a different body of water and that maybe Prognathodon and Tylosaurus inhabited that same body of water. 
So you see definitely a habitat spread from this isotope. And I think the strontium kind of confirms this as well. Um, the strontium isotopes give also this huge range for prognathodon. So again, um, because it comes from soil via runoff in the seawater, if you have differences in that, it means that you have been in different bodies of water. So different, um, yeah, uh, different depths and different um, uh, lengths from your shore. The other mosasaurs have similar ranges, I would say, even the turtles. And then you just have that tylosaur offset again. So I think this is pretty cool. If you put them all together, you see like a prognathodon different behavior from the other mosasaurs. So what I think was happening here was, okay, it didn't want to um, be too much into the other mosasaurs way. There was competition for food and prognathodon just went back and forth to near shore and offshore to feed. Um, whereas the big mosasaur maybe dove a little deeper, prognathodon actually just went closer to the shore and offshore. Um, and maybe tylosaurus stayed more in uh, the upper levels of the sea, but I think we would need more data points because we only have one tylosaur in our collection. So this would be cool to study with other tylosaurs in the future. But I think we have a little bit of uh, an idea now for, of these mosasaurs from the bear paw and their feeding style and their lifestyle. We see uh, niche differentiation. We see that from the, the microware and the EDX analysis. But it's not as simple as just you know, a, a food chain with everybody having one uh, and the same position. They were dynamic feeders and some of them uh, were feeding on things that we weren't expecting such as the, the softer invertebrates for uh, the prognathodons or the, actually the harder food items for the platycarpins. Um, especially from the isotopes, we see more habitat repartitioning. So we see them staying out of each other's way. We see them going to different bodies of water to feed or uh, deeper or, or shallower. Um, and that is also very cool because that's what you would expect but that I think that was hard to measure so I think the isotopes kind of are indicative, indicative of that and uh, yeah I think the take-home message is just that their feeding behavior was a lot more complex than okay one eats this the other eats that um, it was a very dynamic ecosystem and uh, yeah this whole analysis as a whole gives a nice insight into bear paw feeding ecology so um, to conclude Thanks a lot for um, paleo artist Joshua Knupe for these really uh, cute mosasaur pictures. Um, I got most of the silhouettes from Philopic. Thanks to a whole bunch of people at uh, Calgary Geosciences who helped me uh, with all of the lab work. And uh, I did the sampling here, but I had to go to Calgary to do the lab work, which was also really nice to do. Um, thanks to Anne Schulp for um, all the collabs and the previous work that he has done that I'm building on. And of course, thanks to the Royal Terrell uh, for a wonderful postdoc and uh, getting me here again. Thank you.